Okay. Uh, just very just to mention here that I have no financial disclosures and any conflicts of interest, and my acknowledgments uh, the, the NIDA Clinical Trials Network uh, and Dr. Dennis Dale. So what uh, I would like to go through initially is uh, a background on the scope of the problem uh, that we will be discussing in here. Uh, first of all, we know very well that uh, substance use and abuse, the whole spectrum of substance use disorders is very much implicated in hospital emergency departments visits. I'm going to be using a lot the ED instead of keep referring to emergency department or emergency room, so I'm going to be using that abbreviation. When we're talking about the, the, uh, uh, the frequency of the problem that we see in the ED of the substance use, we're talking about two aspects. Either patients would be presenting with substance use related illnesses, consequences, or they could have presented uh, with some particular injury that uh, is related to the substance use. Uh, uh, for example, uh, if they are driving under the influence and they ended up being hospitalized or admitted to the ED for uh, uh, head injury or uh, a loss of consciousness. And so this is really extremely important to uh, understand because once we will be uh, looking at uh, the interventions that would be effective in the ED uh, settings, we look at what we call windows of, of opportunity or we're looking at teachable moments. And I will discuss what I mean by that a little bit later on. But I refer to the uh, uh, importance of looking at it that what we will be also addressing is settings and situations uh, in the ED when patients present with a particular injury that we believe is related to either alcohol and other substances. And again, I will be talking about alcohol and drugs both. And the most important uh, issue here to understand is, for example, if you look at some of the studies, more than half of arrested reckless drivers tested negative on alcohol also screened positive for other substances, which means that uh, the patients that we see in the emergency room who come in for uh, uh, alcohol use uh, uh, or alcohol related problems, if they come in for mostly being intoxicated on alcohol, you're going to see most likely uh, 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 these patients using other substances that could also contribute to the presentation of DED. And this is really extremely important in terms of the clinically because uh, then we would need to basically address not just the drinking, but we need to also address other drug use. And I will talk also briefly about the, the tobacco use, which is really another perfect opportunity in the ED to, uh, uh, to address. And unfortunately, we don't see it done as effectively, and we don't see it done as consistently. So again, the, 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 my point is uh, 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 here about the importance of looking at substances that include alcohol that goes uh, uh, beyond alcohol that are implicated in uh, transportation clashes, which really explains a lot uh, the trauma uh, patients that we see uh, 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 in the ED uh, could be uh, 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 not just really using alcohol, but they could be also using other substances. So here, again, I would like to continue with a little bit of that background to give you some sense of what the extent of the problem is. And I tried not to include a lot of the references in the slides, as you've noticed, because I don't want to overwhelm the slides. At the end of the presentation, there would be a list of references that I've used. And also, you have my email address. And uh, uh, if you have any particular uh, uh, information you would like me to send you regarding uh, any particular topic of what we're going to be discussing here, I can send you the reference. And uh, 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 so let me know. So the another ED study that has been done in California revealed that one-third of the violence-related injuries involved combined alcohol and other substance use. So again, here we have three issues as we talked about initially. The illness, so the substance use-related consequences. The injury uh, uh, that, uh, that could lead to, uh, uh, that substance use that could lead to the injury as a presentation. And the other thing is basically the violence-related injuries in particular that usually involve some substance, whether it's alcohol or other drugs. And now getting into a little bit of this, some of these numbers, and the reason why I thought I'll show you some of these numbers, just to give you the, an idea of the extent of the problem and 
uh, that we see uh, in the ED. Over 2 million ED visits in 2006, like 2.3 percent, were related to either the patient's use of alcohol, another person's use of alcohol, or both. So uh, here we have a little bit of a different twist on the issue is that uh, uh, it's not really at the time when the patient necessarily presents he or she using the alcohol, but it could be that the patient is presenting uh, to the ED as a result of an injury that was inflicted on them as a result of their significant other or the person in their family who uh, uh, attacked them uh, 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 when they were using substances. So keeping that in mind, so it is really always important, for example, when we're looking at intimate partner violence problems, they most of the time involve alcohol at least or other substances. Uh, here, this is from the study from the Drug Abuse Warning Network. And the numbers are really fascinating here because it gives us a sense of the extent of the problem here. 1.7 million ED visits, as you can see, in 2006 were related to drug misuse and abuse. This is really significant here. And if we look at illicit drug use, it accounted for one third, like around 31%. Non-medical use of prescription drugs, which is really becoming more and more problematic, as you know, accounted for another 28%. 7% were related to consumption of alcohol alone by a minor, which is really extremely important then because here the interventions with the adolescents could be potentially very helpful at the time when the adolescents present with an injury as a re related to the drinking, for example, under the influence. 34% were a combination of illicit drugs, alcohol, and or non-medical use of prescription drugs. And I'm referring here to either benzodiazepine or narcotics. So continuing here with the scope of the problem and also some other uh, uh, numbers that I would like to share with you here. And uh, uh, for example, in the ED departments, in the ED patients are more likely than primary care patients or the general population to report misuse of alcohol, drugs, and tobacco, which means when they present to the ED, it is really a perfect teachable moment in a sense because most likely they're going to report more easily than other settings whether they've been misusing alcohol, drugs, or you, you smoking uh, cigarettes. And if we look at the big picture of the substance use disorders, the rates are around 14.7%. I mean, this is really very much significant. and keeping in mind that these rates of substance use disorders are underreported by the patients. So the patients can present mentioning some, some sort of substance use at the same time that their tendency to really report them is not as uh, uh, very open, not, not done as in a very open way and they have a tendency to, uh, particularly when it comes to the alcohol, to underestimate how much they've been drinking. Overall, the rates of substance use in the ED range from, I'm going to give this a huge range, is from 4% 4% to 47%. I mean, you're going to tell me, well, this is a significant, really, uh, range here. This is a, a, a well, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of studies that have been done looking at that. They use different definitions, different methodologies, so uh, the range is very much wide, in a sense, and uh, uh, still, the, what it means basically is that it is a significant problem that can really be uh, that cannot be uh, 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 ignored. Between one fourth and one and half of patients presenting to ED, they are at risk or positive for alcohol use disorders. What I mean by that, the AUDs, is that they are really at risk drinking. So, and I'm going to talk a little bit briefly what I mean by that. There is a whole continuum when it comes to the drinking. Some patients can present with uh, uh, drinking at a level where it's called hazardous, which is a level of is really problematic drinking, but they can also present when they are fully addicted to the alcohol, which is really the dependence scale. So, in a sense, when we're thinking about the patients presenting to the EDs, they could be using uh, alcohol at the at-risk level or they could be fully uh, addicted to the alcohol. So again, this is really significantly important why it is really uh, 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 so crucial to address AUD or SUD in the ED is because the presentation 
because of the high prevalence rates, it creates a huge burden on the ED systems. And we hear that all the time, that uh, staff members get burned out by seeing so many uh, patients who present severely intoxicated with alcohol. They don't know what to do with them. They uh, don't do any sort of interventions. They get them sober up, no intervention that they sent out, and they come back to the ED uh, a few hours later or two days later with the same presentations and the same cycle continues. That creates significant burden uh, in terms of really burning out the, uh, the staff at the same time. Also, the burden is significantly fiscal and also uh, 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 on all levels when it comes to uh, uh, operations in the EDs. So continuing here, well, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the alcohol and then I'll move to the, the drugs. And as I mentioned, a lot of the patients present in the EDs uh, have at-risk or problematic alcohol use. Unfortunately, the alcohol screening is limited, and uh, very, very few patients undergoing routine care receive interventions to cut back or stop drinking. So the patients would show up, let's say, for with uh, uh, heart-related problems, and they have they report that they've been using alcohol. Not much is done about the alcohol. Most of the focus is on the uh, uh, heart problems and. Uh, no intervention is delivered regarding the alcohol use, which as you really know very well, the alcohol use could also potentially affect the heart disease and could affect the, the, the adherence to the medications or could affect uh, uh, different uh, high blood pressure. Uh, so different things that are really not addressed uh, uh, in DED. So here, this is what we call the teachable moment has been defined by the American College of Surgeons, but also been defined as really the when patients presents to the EDs, it's really what we call like a, particularly for example, let's say they present with an injury related to drinking under the influence or any sort of uh, other drug uh, related injury. It's in a sense, uh, the time from the injury to uh, the time when they are in DED, in a sense, is what we call like a window of opportunity to jump on it and to really do whatever at that point in time. And this is using more what we call that teachable moment when they are in DED to do an intervention. And in fact, the American College of Surgeons, they mandated alcohol screenings among admitted trauma patients for the level one and two trauma centers. So this is interesting. So you mandate to screen people, everybody, for alcohol who present to the trauma uh, centers. And the question is, well, how is it really done? Well. As we've seen it uh, done, unfortunately, it's been done through just checking what we call like biological uh, markers, like uh, blood alcohol level. So they go and check an alcohol level. And the problem is that with checking just a blood alcohol level, it's not by itself uh, 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 going to identify the patients who have the alcohol problems. So uh, uh, blood alcohol level and other biomarkers, like for example, uh, liver enzymes, they fail to detect the majority of patients with alcohol problems. So the issue is you can get blood alcohol level, but if the blood alcohol level is really low, it does not necessarily always indicate that the patient doesn't have a drinking problem. So, And also when the blood alcohol level is really high, let's say, for example, 314, that is used as a perfect teachable moment to present the patient with the dangers related to having such a high alcohol level in their system, which is being severely intoxicated with alcohol, and the dangers and the consequences of the severe alcohol intoxication, and having a conversation or an intervention with the patient to get them to see the, uh, 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 the seriousness of their drinking, and get them to start realizing the consequences of their drinking, and what they would want to do in terms of really changing their drinking, whether they want to reduce or stop it. So again, the whole issue of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the emergency department as a window of opportunity for a lot of these patients when they come in. The visit itself to the emergency department is a window of opportunity that leads to a teachable moment to do the intervention there at the moment when the patients present with uh, 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 alcohol or drug-related uh, 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 consequences, or as I mentioned, the injuries. I'll give you the example. A lot of the studies have been done with adolescents who present with uh, injuries related to drinking under the influence or even being in fights and uh, uh, and uh, getting drunk and uh, getting hit and uh, with some physical injuries and 
this is in a sense when they present to the ED is a perfect uh, teachable moment to intervene there and uh, address whether uh, they realize the consequences of their drinking while they are intoxicated, uh, where they are driving, or not necessarily just to reduce the drinking, but also to prevent them from drinking and driving. So again, the, the interventions here could have two folds. They could help reduce the drinking in general or eliminate the drinking, and they can also help patients change their behaviors when it comes to drinking and driving. They could still drink, but at least if they drink and don't drive, then you're really, in a way, significantly minimizing the risk here. One more slide here, and we'll uh, take some of the questions here and the comments. In regards to the drugs here, uh, in terms of the scope of the problem, unfortunately, a lot of what's been done uh, uh, in terms of the ED, uh, uh, what we've been seeing, is that uh, a very little or no routine screening for drug use in the ED setting and compared to the alcohol. And this is why now most of the interventions that have been looked at in the ED are targeting particularly drug use and also screening for drug use that is not unfortunately done on a regular basis. And, uh, and the reason is also because we don't have a clear drug screening tools that are available and uh, we don't have any major studies that have shown that uh, uh, these uh, the screening and doing the interventions for drug use in the ED work necessarily as well. In fact, I'm going to mention to you a study we're doing in, uh, uh, as a part of the Clinical Trials Network, which is a multi-site study looking at screening and motivational assessment and referral and treatment in the emergency departments and uh, uh, focusing obviously on the drug use. And uh, this is one thing I mentioned to you earlier that uh, we don't want to forget about it is the fact that there is good evidence that tobacco screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment uh, in the ED improves significantly the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, health outcomes. And look at, for example, the rates of actual screening uh, for smoking. They are 32.5% to 56%, which is really very low. I mean, we should be able to screen everybody, basically, for the tobacco. The problem is, is you end up screening the patients, but if you don't do much after that, what would be really, in a sense, the point, yes, you've identified they have a, a, a smoking addiction, but if you don't also intervene, you're really uh, 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 not approaching the problem as aggressively as you should be. So here I'm going to take like a, a five, uh, uh, four to five minute uh, break to see if there are any questions, any comments. Uh, Chris, do, do we have any uh, questions there? Uh, we don't have any questions yet, but I would encourage everybody to please submit your questions or comments, maybe uh, situations that you've encountered in your ER, um, questions about maybe what the screens are, how you deal with somebody who shows up uh, with these issues. Um, let us know what's going on in your neighborhood. Yes, yes, we would like to hear or any kind of sort of comments about your experiences, any challenges you've uh, dealt with. You know, we want to, would like to make it as much interactive as we could here because I, I, I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm not overwhelming you here with too much information. I'll try to really uh, keep it as uh, practical and as uh, uh, really uh, uh, informational at the same time, as I said, practical and, and also uh, uh, if you can really share any challenging situations you've gone through, and I will, I will get into more of the details of how we do the screenings and all these uh, uh, things in the uh, in the ED. But it's definitely very helpful to hear some perspectives from you, even if it's not a question, uh, any sort of particular comment. Okay. Um, I one just came in. They're saying, why isn't screening universally done in all ERs? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, you know, first of all, because the, the, the emergency departments do not see necessarily that it is their job, in a sense, that it is their responsibility to do that. And unfortunately, with our emergency rooms, how they operate at this point in time, they are swamped with a lot of problems and what they end up having a tendency to do is to focus on the acute problems that the patients present with and not look at what 
the underlying issues that could have been generating these problems and these consequences. And this is the same situation we have in primary care. In primary care settings, uh, the, the primary care uh, physicians would always tell you why it's my responsibility to screen for alcohol and drugs. I, I have to deal with uh, uh, heart problems, diabetes, uh, uh, you know, and all these other issues and medical issues. And sometimes I have to also screen for depression, for anxiety, and you expect me to also screen for substance use and, and alcohol. And the other big problem, and I will touch on that a little bit later, is that the, uh, the sense that uh, uh, that it is not their responsibility, but also a lot of the ER uh, physicians or staff, they are not trained on how to do the screening, and they are not trained on what sort of interventions they can do, and we're going to talk about that in terms of the brief interventions, and, and also there is the big issue of whether they realize that uh, 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 if they do these screenings, they can also bill for these screenings, so there are some really codes that could be used for billing for these services. The issue is a, a multi-level problem. First of all, not seeing the responsibility that the ER staff should really do. Second is basically a lack of training and implementation and dissemination of training and lack of free supervision. And also the biggest challenge for a lot of these uh, EDs is that uh, if they do not have particularly the, 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 the resources were to send these patients. Let's say they identify somebody with uh, a major drinking problem and they do not know what sort of resources in the community they can refer them to for treatment, they're going to be really stuck with that and they won't really do it and they won't really follow through. And, uh, uh, and so in a sense, you know, that's really also a big problem and that is really uh, uh, what we are trying to look at more and more now is that to really make it more of a routine, the screening, but also to help with whatever resources the staff would need in the ED to facilitate referral to treatment, which is really a big, big challenge. Thank you for the question. Um, I have one more. You want to take it now? Sure. Okay. Um, the question of when to give medical clearance for a patient is always a hard issue. Should the patient be allowed to be admitted to a psych unit when the BAC number has fallen to 0.1, or can they be admitted as soon as possible? Well, I mean, I, th I think it depends on uh, the, the individual. It depends on uh, if you're looking at patients who have uh, a history of complicated withdrawal and like uh, seizures or DTs, and uh, we have to be extremely careful. And because throughout the time when these patients start being uh, uh, weaned off in a sense when they start really their uh, BAC starts going down you know they can be also at very high risk at that time for uh, major withdrawal symptoms so in a sense uh, the remembering that they as long as they are monitored in any setting and evaluated in that setting once they sober up and they are able to cognitively process the information because unfortunately the problem is that what happens particularly in the AED is that the patient will present severely intoxicated with blood alcohol level of three, uh, 300 or 400 and what ends up really happening is that uh, they let them sober up and uh, uh, and then once they sober up the patient starts feeling well, starts feeling better and they say well you know they're going to leave and no intervention is done at that time. In fact you know the perfect teachable moment that I've been talking about is when this is really happening, when the patient starts clearing up and sobering up and thinking more clearly is to intervene at that time. And at that time also to identify whether they would need to be hospitalized to be detoxed safely and uh, or whether they could really utilize more outpatient uh, treatment or detox on an outpatient basis. So there are different ways of looking at it depending on uh, each patient's uh, uh, situation. Thank you. That's it for now. Okay. Thank you, guys. So here, I want to continue with uh, with uh, discussing the scope of the problem here and going back to some of the questions that were asked about, uh, you know, why this is not happening? Why it does not happen, the screening, brief interventions in the ED? And uh, and I'll tell you, uh, uh, also, unfortunately, the uh, the problem has been that uh, there are not a lot of studies that have been done, as I mentioned, particularly for the drugs, that would really, uh, uh, in a way, 
uh, tell us that, look, if you do it, it does really work. It reduces substance use. It reduces the consequences. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know that works and what we don't know clearly whether it works or not. But clearly we know that the ED itself is an important entry portal into the medical care system. We know that a lot of patients who utilize just the ED, unfortunately, because of our uh, healthcare system and particularly for the underinsured and uninsured, uh, these patients would show up in the ED because they know they will get treatment, they cannot turn, be turned down. And, uh, and unfortunately what ends up really happening is that uh, uh, when we see these patients just in, in the emergency uh, uh, department setting, that uh, uh, you know it's a perfect teachable moment for them to start helping them with uh, the particular issues. But if there is no system that would help us uh, get them connected uh, 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 on an outpatient basis on some level, uh, that becomes very problematic because what ends up really happening with these patients, they're going to keep relying on the ED. Uh, all the time to address any issues. So again, this is also a biggest struggle that we have when it comes to preventive medicine. Unfortunately, we have uh, uh, shifted completely the way we do things to uh, uh, really more treatment than really prevention. And uh, uh, and this obviously uh, 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 crosses all behavioral medicine, not just really uh, uh, substance abuse. So clearly here, uh, uh, um, you know, the, given that we know the epidemiology of substance use, as I mentioned to you, the numbers that the delivery of uh, 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 effective uh, brief interventions, and I'm going to talk specifically, I'm going to keep talking about the brief interventions, what they are, and I'm going to be specific about that. For alcohol, drugs, and tobacco use has definitely a huge potential to uh, 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 really have a significant impact uh, from the public health implications. So again, when we're really intervening with these patients, these patients are not going to come as often to the emergency room. They're going to be using much less, whether alcohol or drugs. And you can imagine the savings uh, that we will eventually make also, and also the impact on the quality of lives that we will see. So here, uh, this is really the next uh, uh, section in a way that I would like to uh, uh, discuss here. And this is uh, the screenings. The screening in instruments that what sort of screening instruments we can use in uh, the uh, ED and or what's been used now. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to discuss also briefly with you the, uh, you know, the concerns that we have is that uh, uh, if these, uh, if the staff are not uh, uh, trained or experienced in using these screenings, are not going to use them. At the same time, there are also the traditional ways of screening, you know, for alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, that do not need necessarily to use any screening instruments. But these instruments are really very easy to use and uh, do not need necessarily uh, uh, hours and hours of training. So, the first one, when we look at the alcohol use disorders, the the first one we're looking at is the what we call the uh, audit, the uh, alcohol use disorders identification test. This is really the most widely used brief instrument. Uh, in fact, uh, we uh, if we look at uh, the audit that is really uh, used, now uh, we uh, we have used a shorter version. The shorter version is really uh, uh, very good. This is a 10 item. Uh, uh, version, the usually the, the, the typical one, the audit, and it does assess uh, particularly the alcohol consumption only. So we would have an idea about how much a patient has uh, 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 a patient has been drinking, and also what it does assess is what we call the at-risk drinking. You know, we look at whether there is a presence of at-risk drinking, and uh, there is a three-item audit C which also assesses the alcohol consumptions only. So when we have a, a, a score of more than four, it indicates a presence of some sort of an alcohol use disorder. And uh, if you would be interested, I, I didn't really put that uh, uh, scale there, but I can definitely send it to you. And, uh, and again, it will really indicate whether there is a presence of an alcohol use disorder. So uh, uh, the cage is another one that is used. And that indicates more when the patients are really uh, uh, dependent. And uh, the cage is basically was used for, uh, developed for use by the primary care physicians. 
and um, um, and basically we have what we call also so the NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and uh, Alcoholism, is uh, they recommend the use uh, uh, of the cage questions, and uh, this will give us also some sense of the quantity and the frequency, and it's like a brief assessment in a way uh, that is really very uh, very clean and. Uh, 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 very quick, and the first the C stands for the cutting down, as in whether they've ever really attempted to cut down, and whether they've been uh, annoyed by people uh, who tell them they are drinking too much and their drinking is affecting them, and whether they feel guilty about their drinking. The G stands for the or eye opener, so uh, which is really what they feel like when they wake up uh, in the morning that they feel like they need to have a drink to uh, get going with the day. So. And this is a screen that has been, uh, in fact, integrated uh, uh, into a toolkit on the American College of Emergency Physicians website. They have a great uh, website, the American College of Emergency Physicians. If you're interested, I can send you the website. And uh, uh, they have a lot of the tools there and that people uh, can use, uh, and also some better understanding of how to screen for alcohol use. And so there is the other one that... Uh, that we uh, we use is uh, is the drink the R I N C the drinkers inventory of consequences. It tells us a lot about we really, the consequences of the drinking. Uh, this is m less often used in that setting. We use it more in research settings. So the two that are really most commonly use on the audit and the cage. And as you see, it's very simple. With the audit, you have 10 questions that are really very, very simple to really do and uh, to answer. And also, if you want to use the abbre abbreviated one, the three-item one, the, it's called the audit C, which is really uh, much, really easier. So when it comes to now the uh, uh, screening instruments for substance use disorders, for the drugs, and uh, uh, before I move to that, I'm going to uh, give you some sense also about the tobacco, for example. Uh, you know, there is no really standard tool in a sense, and some of the current uh, screening practices, they include simple queries such as, uh, do you smoke? How much do you smoke? And you can take it from there. They, you can use them in the ED settings, and, uh, 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 and uh, it's really, unfortunately, uh, the routine screening for tobacco use is not a standard of care. In the ED, and I'm going to keep repeating that, unfortunately, and it can definitely, definitely, definitely can be improved. So moving into the, the uh, drug use, <coughs> the first screening I'll talk about is called the drug abuse screening test, which is the most common use screening, it's 10 items, and it uh, gives us some the sense of the drug problem severity, and if it is, if the score is more than equal or more than 8, then uh, there is a serious problem here. And this is uh, uh, important also to uh, uh, to really train people in doing, and uh, it's also very easy to use. The other one is called the assist. The assist, unfortunately, is uh, is really not used as often clinically. It's been used mostly in uh, in the research uh, settings, and now uh, we've been using it more and more now in clinical settings. It's uh, it's the alcohol smoking and substance involvement screening test. This has been uh, in a way conceptualized by the uh, World Health Organization and it's used to assess 10 substances. It's a very compre comprehensive. Uh, you have uh, tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, amphetamine type stimulants, inhalants, sedatives, uh, hallucinogens, opioids, and other drugs. And it's really uh, very comprehensive and interestingly enough, if you're also interested, you can go on the NIDA website and uh, 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 and it, there is a, a, a website version that can be used, and uh, a modified version that is a really more simple version to use. And uh, in medical settings in general, not just in DED, in medical settings in general. And uh, again, as I said, you go on the uh, website, on the NIDA website, the nida.nih.gov, and you can definitely uh, uh, download that. And it could be really used. And uh, 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 and uh, and really uh, gives you very much of a sense also of where the patients are in terms of uh, at-risk use. So it kind of, in a way, the screening, that screening instruments will give you a sense whether they are at low risk, uh, medium risk, and high risk. And uh, obviously with the low risk, there is nothing 
that needs to be done is more like to be addressing the problem is going to be more in the medium and the high risk. So uh, uh, the other thing is as simple as it is when it comes to any sort of particular study that have been done evaluating screening tools for drug use in the ED, unfortunately no studies have really looked at really that, but one single question that has been well validated that could be also used used in the ED setting, which is how many times over the past 12 months have you used drugs? If they say once or if they respond by once or more than one, then you continue here by asking what's a particular substance and then you go from there. If they say zero, none, no, I have not used at all, no times that I've used before, then you really move on and the screening is negative. So as simple as it is, because the problem is when you ask a question as that, do you use illicit drugs, uh, uh, it's a close-ended question that most likely people are going to respond, no, they are not going to be as uh, really open about it. You're going to tell me how is that really different for the smoking. Also, it's the same thing with the smoking that you have to really also not take it for granted that if you ask people do they smoke, that they're going to really be honest and respond honestly about it. So, but again, as I mentioned to you, uh, 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 also, for example, another way of asking about illicit drugs, whether uh, they've used uh, uh, also a prescription drug that was not prescribed for them, or they took, took it only for the experience or feeling it caused. So this is really important because we need to really start separating, as we see now more and more patients uh, uh, using a lot of these uh, narcotics. Uh, uh, off the street, you know, and uh, uh, prescribed originally by physicians, but uh, non for non-medical reasons, they start misusing them, is to remember that when we're asking them about that, is to be specific whether they are using any prescription drug that was not prescribed for them. So here now, this is the third section. Before I move on here uh, to the third section, I want to see if there are any questions that I can uh, address uh, regarding the screening tools? Um, I have uh, one person that has a question and then a comment. Okay. Um, the question is, remove the exclusion cause for medical expenses from the Uniform Individual Accident and Sickness Policy Provision Law. Does this deter others from drug testing and SBIRT? And then they have UPPL. I am not, uh, hmm. so can you repeat the question because I'm not really sure what uh, uh, the, it, it has like a couple of things here, you know. Go ahead. Um, it, goes, please. it says remove the exclusion clause. Okay. Excuse me. Remove the exclusion clause for medical expenses from the Uniform Individual Accident and Sickness Policy Provision Law uh -huh. that deter others from drug testing and expert? Well, not not necessarily. I, I think, you know, that's really a good question. You know, I, I am I don't believe so. I don't really I don't believe this does necessarily happen. You know, I think there is a mention here about the expert also that not just yes. the drug screening. Okay. Well I'm gonna talk about that particularly. I, I don't believe this uh, that's from my perspective, I don't believe so. Okay. Um the same person says I use a single question, how many times in the past year have you had more than five drinks for men or four drinks for women in a single setting? Um, and he feels this is 85% sensitive. Yes, I mean, this is an excellent, this is the an IAAA question. You know, if we look at basically the norms of what is defined as a really a normal kind of drinking, like the, the, the norms as really uh, uh, defined by the NIAAA, it's basically defined as per week, you know, for males, no more than 14 drinks, and for females, no more than seven. But if we look at the, the what we call the episodes of uh, uh, binge drinking, what we define as binge drinking according to the NIAAA for males is in a sitting, more, five or more drinks, and for females, uh, four or more drinks. So when you really ask about whether they have uh, uh, more than five, like four, four, for females, more four or more than four in a sitting, you're really talking about whether they've had an episode of binge drinking, 
which is an episode of binge drinking, could be a risky drinking, could be a under the at risk drinking. And uh, the the what really other definition that is really very important is what we call the heavy drinking. Heavy drinking, which is really at risk drinking, is that for males when you have five or more episodes of binge drinking, and for females four or more episodes of binge drinking. So all what you're really asking is really very, very relevant to what you're really assessing for, whether they've had, how many times they've had episodes of binge drinking. I can say that even one episode of binge drinking could be at risk drinking, depending on what the situation is. But this is really a good start in a sense. I think that one thing also that could be really, if you want to assess for drinking in general, like asking particularly over the course of the week, for seven days, how many drinks do you have? And when it is really more for females, more than seven, then there is here at-risk drinking. And if it is more than 14 for males, then this is at-risk drinking, and then you would have to address it. Okay. Um, uh, the person is clearing out something from the previous question. Uh, he says the UPPL is a law that allows insurers to withhold payment for care required because of intoxication. Well, yes, but you know the but but how? But first of all, the patients when they present, if it, it, the relevance of it to the emergency department, when they present to the emergency department with alcohol intoxication, alcohol intoxication is considered a medical condition. So what ends up really happening is that if patients would come in with alcohol intoxication, they require medical care. We see a lot of patients who are really intoxicated, but they do not really seek necessarily medical care or they do not get into some sort of a medical care. But once they are in the ED, you can definitely basically bill for that service based on the fact that when they are presenting with alcohol intoxication, it's a medical condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then there's uh, one other question. Would you consider using the four Ps or the five Ps screening tool with a pregnant woman entering the ER? Yes, you know, I didn't honestly, the, I wasn't really sure. That's a very good question, in fact, about looking at the pregnant woman, how we assess it. Yes, you could, you could really definitely use that. I don't see any much of a difference, to be honest with you, with screening, whether pregnant woman screening really, uh, and which is really extremely important if we want to screen at least some patients, you know, we should at least screen everybody, every patient who, who, who is pregnant. And yes, you can really definitely do it. You know, I think there is, from my perspective, you know, it's just more thinking about it as really important to screen for not just really drugs or alcohol, but also screen for tobacco, which is really could be very uh, 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 significantly problematic in pregnant women. Um, okay, I think we've finished all those off. Okay, any other comments or uh, that's it? Yes, that's it for now, thanks. Okay. All right. So we're going to be moving now to the intervention approaches. And uh, so here, what are we talking about when uh, we're discussing the interventions? We're, uh, and again, this is the word intervention sometimes can sound a little bit like uh, something really very uh, elaborate or uh, something really very uh, 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 extensive or uh, it is not, does not have to be like that. And I'll tell you some of the interventions done in DED, what we talk about the brief interventions, are basically ranged between 10 and 20 minutes. I mean, some of them would really also uh, uh, be done in uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes or even longer than that. Or some of them, you know, would be uh, probably uh, uh, even uh, would require like what we call a booster session. So I'll talk about this in detail a little bit, you know, uh, later here. So, uh, but one of the short interactive sessions that could really happen uh, 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 is basically could be five minutes even, could be five minutes or seven minutes. And, uh, and it does incorporate what we call the personalized feedback. What I mean by that is that let's say when the patient presents with a blood alcohol level of uh, 300, then you can present it to them, look, I would like to review with you uh, what your blood alcohol level is. And uh, this is 300, 300 fits under really severely 
uh, intoxicated, uh, you could end up with uh, serious uh, complications and consequences. The consequences are this and this and this. And ask them, well, what do you think now that I share this with you? So in a sense, you really, what you're trying to do here, you're trying to elicit from the patients uh, a, a feedback about what you share with them as a fact. So you use the fact, uh, in terms of uh, fact finding, you use the clinical uh, 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 statement here, you use a clinical finding and you elicit from them their reactions on that. And it does incorporate a lot of what you call the advice. Advice giving is not to tell the patient why well, you should stop drinking, you shouldn't be drinking. How we give an advice makes a huge difference. You can't tell people what to do. When you tell people what to do, they're going to react to it, you know, and they're going to give you the argue for the other way around. So what you can clearly do is when you want to give an advice is that you say or you can share with them, look, I am really concerned that the way you were drinking recently with coming with a blood alcohol level of 300, that is extremely severely dangerous because uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the severe intoxication you ended up having. And the concern that I have that your drinking is already affecting your liver, and in particularly if you have liver enzymes there, and your drinking is already affecting your ability to function. So what do you think about that? So here basically what you're doing, you're really giving them the consequences and eliciting from them some sort of reaction and then asking them whether they would want to really know more about how drinking could really potentially affect them and how serious consequences they could really see more and more if they continue to drink. And then you can give them then the advice as from what we know, if you were to continue drinking at that level, that you could uh, damage your liver more and more. You can end up with uh, cirrhosis of the liver. You can end up with other complications, heart complications, high blood pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result of that, this could compromise your quality of life. So again, these uh, approaches are not uh, necessarily going to take hours and hours. These are very short interactive sessions that could have a significant impact. And, and they are really very much, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, is they can help not necessarily eliminating or getting people to stop substance use, alcohol or substance use, but they can help reduce substance use to lower risk of future illness and injury, which is really extremely essential here that we want to look at. So looking at them as more brief interventions, as more from the harm reduction approach to. And they are found to be very feasible to perform in the ED setting by routine ED clinical staff. This does not require people who are really uh, PhDs, you know, and, uh, uh, and very high uh, or physicians to be able to really do that. The, uh, I gave some of these the different forms that can take and uh, how you also give the information. There is a big difference between information giving and information exchanging. So you giving information to somebody, oh, drinking causes this and this and this and this, and did you get it? and then you move on. That's information giving this does not really work. Or what do you know about what the drinking can do to your, to your health in general, particularly your heart, your liver? And then you elicit from them some reaction, and then you give them more information. You do what we call, and I'm going to discuss it a little bit more now, is the ask, tell, ask, you know, which means that you're really uh, uh, initiating an exchange about their drinking and their use of drugs. Or you, we can do what we call in medical settings sometimes the check, chung, check, which means you check with them about something, like for example how, uh, uh, how much they see their drinking as problematic. You uh, 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 give them a chunk of information and you elicit from them more information by checking on, uh, with them again uh, 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 to continue that exchange, to continue that conversation. There are some of the approaches in terms of brief interventions that have been used uh, in, uh, in research studies. For example, the, the uh, brief negotiated interviewing. It's been conceptualized uh, quite a while ago, and it does basically incorporate a lot of what we call the motivational interviewing approach. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. I believe uh, a lot of you would be, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit briefly. It uses basically the same principles and uh, strategies of motivational interviewing. And what it does basically is for brief negotiated interviewing, it is brief, takes basically 15 to 20 minutes. It incorporates the feedback about the liver enzymes, uh, blood alcohol level, how much they've been drinking, how much they deviate from the norm of how much they are drinking. And basically along the way, you know, is to explore with them about also the pros and cons of drinking and uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, also discuss uh, whether they are ambivalent about uh, wanting to stop drinking and what makes them ambivalent, and eventually come up with uh, the decision about what they want to really do. You know, and uh, and this is really very important because eventually what you really want to uh, 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 achieve from this, what we call the brief negotiated interviewing, is a particular goal that the patient would want to pursue. And, and some of the goals that patients would want to pursue, they could really say, look, I want to try not to drink uh, as much as I used to, or I don't want to drink anymore at all, and these are the reasons why I don't want to do it. So you do what we call also the eliciting change talk. You want to hear more from them, reasons they're going to give us uh, why they don't want to drink, or why they need to stop drinking, and why they have to stop drinking and uh, uh, and ha whether they are able to do it or not. The brief motivational approaches interventions, you know, and uh, that is back from uh, an adaptation in a way of from more brief uh, of the motivation interviewing is basically it uh, uses the same principles in a sense and uh, as the brief intervention and uh, very much uh, used uh, as uh, more often to really, uh, in the sense that it incorporates all the principles and strategies of motivation interviewing, and uh, 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 and really put it in the, and really package it in a way that would help uh, the patient explore, help the patient explore their drinking or their substance use, and uh, and uh, come up also with a plan of action. The one thing we know, and this is my really, uh, in a sense, my point that I was trying to really to make very early on about the importance of doing these brief interventions, particularly in the, in the ED setting, is that the research showed us that any intervention is superior compared to the treatment as usual, which is no intervention, which is unfortunately what is basically done in the ED is no interventions. Uh, to somebody who's been drinking heavily, they come in with the high blood alcohol level, severely intoxicated, they get them to sober up, let them sit in the emergency room for like three, four hours, and then once they are sobering up, you know, they send them out with nothing, no intervention. I mean, obviously, this is not going to really make much of a difference at all. Now I'm going to, uh, you know, talk about uh, uh, the basic principles of these brief interventions, and, uh, and then I'm going to really uh, go back to uh, uh, the ED setting and how this could be really done. And uh, first of all, we need to understand basic principles of how do people change their behaviors, particularly when it comes to using substances, whether it's alcohol or uh, 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 or drugs, and or any other uh, 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 you know health behaviors, uh, you know and. Uh, the the issue is uh, first of all four things you know people uh, 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 change voluntarily only when as you can see here on the slide and it's really highlighted when they become concerned about the need for change when they become convinced that the change is in their best interest or they will benefit it will benefit them more than it cost them and when they organize a plan of action, it's not enough to really be convinced that this is what I wanted to do. You have to come up with a plan of action, how you're going to do it. Well, this is not going to be also enough because you can come up with a plan of action and not follow through with the action. And, and you can take then the next step is going to be taking the action, which means doing it. Uh, I want to stop here for a second, uh, Chris, see whether there are any particular uh, questions or comments before I proceed to talk about this, the different uh, 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 theories related to behavior change. Uh, somebody has a comment based on the previous uh, questions about um, the law and insurance coverage. They say um, many providers fear documenting intoxication for fear that resultant required trauma care won't be covered. I'm sorry. Said again. I couldn't hear. There was. Uh, I couldn't hear the question very well. Can you? Um, yes. Bit, uh, uh, yeah. Many, if, many if, providers if, fear documenting intoxication for fear that resulting required trauma care won't be covered. So you're saying that some providers. Uh, I'm not sure. They won't document that because. Well, of they're they're uh, afraid to document it because they're afraid that any resultant. Uh, trauma care won't be covered by the insurance if they document it. 
I'm not really sure why this would read it. They should really, if the patient present, they should really document it. I'm not sure how this could potentially affect the, the, the trauma care. That you, you really, uh, the concern uh, is we'll, would, we'll ask him to uh, clarify, and then um, we can yes, go back I, to that at your next. Uh, I'm not clear. Okay. I'm not really sure what uh, what really the issue here. Uh, it's like they the providers would not document that the patient is presenting intoxicated because they are concerned that the insurance would not cover, you know, the 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 the, the visit. You know, is this what it is? I'm I'm not really sure. You know. Uh, yeah, we'll ask him to clarify, and then uh, we'll go back. Any, to later. any questions regarding the brief intervention so far? Um, no, that that was the only one in this section. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's uh, proceed here. Uh, okay. So, as we said, the people change because they are concerned, convinced, they have a plan of action, and they follow through with the action. They take the steps. Okay. So how now, the question is going to be, uh, how can we help them change their drinking or drug using behavior? So how can we uh, facilitate that process? Okay. Well, here, uh, let me tell you, in, in medical settings, you know, uh, this is extremely important to keep in mind, uh, is the communication styles that are really used. And uh, uh, two things, you know, that we see a lot happening in that setting, you know, is that uh, 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 there are two major styles that we see, either of what we call the guiding style or directing style. Oh, I need to tell you, this is the, the directing style. I need to tell you that if you don't stop drinking, you're going to end up damaging your liver, and uh, you're going to end up with all these consequences of having high blood pressure, and also it's going to affect your heart, you know, and all these kind of things, you know, and then you, in a sense, with the directing style, what you're really doing is you're really telling people uh, and really directing them to really do something. With the guiding style, you know, is more about working with the patient, meeting them where they are, and helping them understand better what they are really going through. So it's a communication, it's a more of a conversation that goes on. With the directing style, there is no real conversation, it's just a one-way thing. And if you look at the three styles of communicating, as you can see there, is the direct, directing, guiding, and following. And what we know very well is the guiding style is the one that works best when it comes to, in general, lifestyle changes. Okay, so here, when it comes to helping patients change their behaviors, their substance use behaviors, we have four important principles that we have to understand. They are simple, you know, and unfortunately, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, settings, particularly these settings, they do not, uh, uh, and particularly medical schools or any sort of medical trainings, they do not uh, help, uh, uh, they do not train the, the, the staff to really understand these uh, factors that are fundamental to uh, 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 understanding how people change and helping people change. And uh, if you look at it in the ED, we're not talking about really just substance use and and, uh, uh, and alcohol. This kind of also uh, uh, in terms of other things like adherence to treatment, to medications, uh, to uh, any sort of a lifestyle, people uh, uh, watching their diet or uh, exercising physical activity. So there are so many uh, uh, things that have to be addressed. First of all, I'm going to talk about what we call the individual choice. This is what we call back from the 60s, you know, the reactance theory, is we know very well, and think about it yourself, if you take away someone's freedom, they react to it. People are not going to like it, they're going to react. And interestingly enough that when you leave it up to the patient to decide, it motivates them to perform the behavior, even if they don't want to do it that much. But if you leave it up to them, and if you really convey that it's up to them to decide and to do it, then trust me, they will really, in fact, start thinking about potentially doing it. And again, this whole idea from, the, from that theory is that no one tells me what to do. I will do whatever I believe is right for me and is important for me. This is what we call self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is that I do what I believe is important for me to do, not what other people tell me is important for me to do. 
second one, empathy, which is really at the core of any sort of brief interventions and versus really this, you know, what we call the confrontational approaches. And this comes from uh, the client-centered approach, the Rogerian approach, which is really when you're really conveying to the patient that you have to show them that uh, uh, you understand, not to say it, because we hear a lot of the time people saying, well, I understand what you're telling me. You don't necessarily, we don't necessarily understand exactly what people's experiences are. We understand if they help us understand what they are going through. So we need to really make sure that the, when it comes to being empathic is more the un, uh, uh, unconditional positive regard, which means meeting the patient where they are and trying to understand what they are going through. It is non-directive, which means that it's a process of helping the patients identify uh, 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 what their own goals are and how they feel about it. And you can really make it more directional in a sense and using the empathic approach as in a more directional way. And in fact, you know, when it comes to the brief intervention that is done particularly in the ED, there is a lot of it is very much direction, which means because there is a specific focus. You are really focusing the session, but you are not really directing it. If someone is expecting to be persuaded, uh, this can be a welcome relief and lowers their resistance, which means that if they feel, if they are expecting that, they, that you are there to help them look at things differently, you know, they, they feel that sense of relief and they will really be less argumentative and less defensive. That's what I mean by lowering the resistance. So here this is fundamental because the whole point of getting the patient to really change is to really elicit more motivation from them and to really strengthen their motivation. And when I say by eliciting, I'm not saying that you're really injecting motivation. It has to really come from them. You're really basically bringing it from within all the way out. And I'll tell you something, if uh, someone sees themselves, what we call this is a self-perception theory, uh, sees themselves doing something, they think they like it. And think about it yourself, you know, with any particular lifestyle behavior that you wanted to change. If they hear themselves saying that they will stop doing something, they will think they will, they, they would think, they will think they can and they will stop. So again, this is how you think about it yourself. When you really, how many times you have a lot of really your own thoughts got you to really think about what you want to do. Sometimes you want to do it, sometimes you don't want to do it. At the same time, when you start basically hearing themselves saying that uh, you will stop doing something, that you will think more about wanting to do it or not. And this is really from back in the 1700, is that, uh, uh, um, 1600, sorry, is uh, from Blaise Pascal, who was a big uh, French philosopher, uh, who said at that time, that people are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those which have come into the minds of others. Which really means how it applies here is that you're going to give the reasons and the arguments. The patients will have to give the arguments why they want to change, why they want to stop drinking, why they want to stop using, and uh, not you. So they would be people would be more persuaded uh, 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 in terms of doing it if they have their own reasons why they want to do it. All right. So here, the what we call, I want to continue with the eliciting motivation, what we call the cognitive dissonance. What does that mean, cognitive dissonance? Um, OK, so here, uh, if you read here on the slide here, if you're really uncomfortable when you, you become more and more uncomfortable, you feel like conflicted when you hold two incompatible beliefs, which means let's say you want to stop and you don't want to stop. You want to stop drinking. At the same time, there's a part of you that want to continue drinking because you like the way it makes you feel. Well, that creates a conflict within you and makes you more uncomfortable and makes you have that urge to do something. You're going to either, you're going to have to resolve it. You're going to either continue drinking or you're going to reduce your drinking. And it's often easier to despise what you cannot get and harder to hold a dissonant thought. So here, the next uh, factor that is important is the readiness. And I believe most of you are familiar with the stages of change. Uh, and uh, this is the Prochaska and the Clemente uh, 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 stages of change, trans theoretical model of change, which is 
uh, initially was uh, uh, studied in smoking cessation, but now it's been validated all across substance use, uh, uh, drug use, alcohol use, uh, eating behaviors, and all this. So there are five stages. The first stage is the pre-contemplation when the patient is not ready to change and not ready to quit drinking or using. Contemplation stage is when patients are thinking about changes to the ambivalence uh, the stage, which is really when the patient wants to do it and doesn't want to do it. The preparation stage is that when patients are planning for the change, which means that they've resolved their ambivalence, they decided, okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to stop drinking, I've decided uh, I'm going to stop drinking, but I don't know how to do it which is the action stage, which is implementing the behavior changes, working with them on the skills to do it. And the maintenance is basically when it comes to sustaining this change. The readiness for change, two factors. People cannot change their behavior unless they feel it's extremely important for them to do it, if it's a top priority for them to do it, and they have the ability and the confidence to do it. But most importantly is the importance, because I can sit and tell you, look, I, I, I want to stop. Uh, uh, drinking, but it's not a top priority for me now to do it. And I know that if I decide to stop drinking, I'm capable of doing it. Well, the confidence here doesn't really apply much because if they don't see it as a top priority for, for them to do it, they are not going to do it. So how it works, the readiness for change, it's very much of a, a really connected to the importance of confidence. If the importance is extremely high, confidence is high, then the readiness is high. And the likelihood chance for patients to change is definitely much higher. So the confidence, this is crucial, you know, and uh, to understand, you know, and this is what we call the concept of self-efficacy. Uh, uh, and the concept is that, uh, and this is something, you know, I'd like you to think about yourself. If you think you can do it, if you believe you can do it, then you will do it. If you don't feel you can do it, if you don't believe, if you don't have the ability to do it, you may not even try. So it is extremely crucial when we're working with patients when it comes to their substance use is to really work on the importance as well as the confidence as we call the self-efficacy. So I want to take like a two-minute break here to see if there are any questions, any uh, uh, comments, and then I'm now back to really putting all this together into what we call the brief interventions. Okay, I actually have two little questions concerning motivational interviewing. These yep. are from different people. One says, um, perhaps we can apply motivational interviewing to the ER staff to motivate them to screen patients. <laughs> that is that is excellent idea. I think, you know, that's really, uh, 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 obviously, the MI could be really used as a way to really get people to really change their behaviors. And yes, that would be perfect to really uh, uh, motivate, work on motivating the staff to see the importance of doing the screening, you know, for substance use, you know. I think, you know, in a sense, I believe there's going to have to be always a buy-in, you know, if, uh, and leadership is extremely important in these uh, settings. So if you have a leadership there that really sees the importance of the uh, screening, then they can help work with their staff using motivational strategies to get them to see the importance of doing it and really train them in doing it. Unfortunately, the problem is, it's not just necessarily uh, doing it. It's more like seeing the importance of doing it and get them to really, in a sense, also help them uh, with the resources they need to be able to do it. Because the staff don't necessarily don't want to do it just for the sake of not wanting to do it because they don't see it as a top priority. And also, particularly if they do not have the resources to do it, and also they don't have the time. That you can come up with so many excuses in a sense. But also some of these excuses are very legitimate, you know, is that they would not do it. But this is an excellent approach, in a sense, to really helping staff change. Um, somebody else said that um, guiding falls in line with motivational interviewing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the motivation interviewing style is a guiding style. I'm going to talk about it a little bit here. Uh, I don't want people to think I'm not going to really mention it because obviously the core of the brief interventions are really related to the motivation interviewing. 
Um, uh, there's somebody here with their hand raised, so I'm going to see if this will work to unmute. Um, Mr. Treveri, I'm going to unmute you. Can can we hear you? Mr. Treveri? No, I guess it must have been a mistake. Okay, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, the next slide here on brief interventions. Again, uh, what is really here, what we need to think about is that the intervention targets and the delivery methods. So what are we targeting? In the ED, we're targeting the substance use, whether it be alcohol, tobacco, or drug. And the delivery method. So the delivery method is what? How is it done? And a lot of these interventions that I've talked about are based on the motivation to viewing principles and basically adherence to healthcare recommendations. We've talked about the NIAAA, the norms. If patients are drinking more than what the norms are, you know, obviously, you know, this uh, the brief intervention would really help uh, refocus the patients on what uh, helping them understand what the norms are and when they deviate from the norms, how they can put themselves at risk. And here, what I want to talk about is really the, the uh, one form of a brief intervention that is used with health risky behaviors, whether it's drinking, using, and uh, is motivational reviewing. And obviously, as we know very well, it's used mostly primarily with adults and adolescents. Now we've been seeing it more in pediatric settings, basically uh, to help family members help their kids to adhere, for example, to uh, medications, such as uh, medications for asthma. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about details in terms of uh, what do we know about it and how it is really uh, done. But one of the things that I want to emphasize over and over again is that big part of the brief intervention is what we call the personalized, providing the personalized information, personalized uh, data, and to increase the motivation to improve health-related behaviors. So what are the six elements of associated with the brief intervention, which are the, the brief effective interventions, which are also at the core of the motivation interviewing. And if we look at, and this is what we call the acronym frames, and I'm going to talk about it, is there is no single accepted definition of how brief brief motivation, brief intervention is uh, must be. And as I told you before, it could be short interactive session ranging from 5 to 60 minutes, and it could really include also incorporate more uh, 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 what we call like a, a boost booster session, you know, whether over the phone, whether uh, in uh, 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 so different ways of doing it. So uh, the next one is what we call the frames. Is the really the core elements of brief interventions. And the first one is the, the F. For the frame, uh, for the in the frames is the feedback regarding personal risk or impairment. For example, if they come in, if an adolescent, 17 to 16 years old, has been drinking and driving and ended up with head injury, you know, obviously you're presented as, look, your head injury is related to your drinking behavior. And uh, uh, emphasis on personal responsibility for change. Remember, I talked about it earlier that it's up to the patient individual choice. It's up to you to decide whether you want to stop drinking or not. We cannot coerce people. We cannot force people. And give a clear advice to change. So when you, uh, as I mentioned, the clear advice is not to tell people what to do, but to really kind of express it in a way that show that you're really concerned and that from what we know, if they would re reduce their drinking, they can feel better. They can uh, not be as uh, struggling with, their, uh, 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 with uh, the consequences of their drinking. So this is important. And always when you're really giving patients, change options, whether uh, inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, and remember to give a menu of choices, not just one option, and get them stuck with one option, and always doing it in a very, very therapeutic, empathic, non-confrontational, non-judgmental approach. And also a big part of the frames, which the S stands for, is the strengthening of the self-efficacy. They have to have the confidence to be able to do it. Take a look here at the at the advantages and disadvantages of uh, uh, brief interventions. It's the time to administer, which is the the cost, feasibility, adaptability. All these are huge advantages, 
and it could be used in different settings, different uh, places. You can manipulate the dose, the timing, you can tailor to individual needs. You don't need too much time for training, you can train anybody in doing it, and it clearly targets a different range of behaviors, particularly the substance use behaviors. And uh, uh, the disadvantages, in a sense, is uh, uh, it does not really change you know, some of the social and environmental factors which are really problematic when it comes to substance abuse. And it is usually more expensive than some community-based strategies. And, uh, and again, we don't clearly know about the duration. And that's, these are the questions that have been always been out there and not completely clear. So here, I'm going to discuss the motivation of the viewing and how the MI fits into that brief intervention. And uh, this is one thing to keep in mind uh, that and I'm going to give you the definition of it very shortly is but to always remember the more you confront and persuade, the more the patient will resist. The more you're going to try to convince me to do something, I want to go the other way around and not do it. And you'll see that, you see that happening a lot in adolescence. Oh my God, you cannot believe it. You just, if you try that with the adolescents, you know, it will backfire immediately, which means that uh, the, that is a, the motivation and approach is really perfect uh, uh, developmentally for working with adolescents. It's the whole point of it is to elicit internal motivation and it requires a lot of the gentle and active listening and always respecting the patient's values and autonomy up to the patient to really do it. And take a look here at the most recent definition of what motivation to viewing is. It's a collaborative, it's a, obviously a working relationship, it's a working together, person-centered form of guiding, so this is a facilitating guiding to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. We have more than 1,000 publications in print and uh, it's, uh, this is the second edition of uh, the MI book. I would recommend that you uh, get that book and there is a whole section also there on basically the use of motivation to view in the emergency room settings. And uh, the third edition is coming out hopefully very soon, maybe in the summer. So what is really the approach? The approach is to focus on fundamentally initially is what we call the relational piece, which is uh, building rapport in the initial stage of the counseling relationship. And the central concept of it, so if you really want to uh, uh, help patients with their motivation and want to elicit motivation and strengthen motivation, then what you're going to need to do fundamentally is to identify, examine, and help patients resolve their ambivalence about changing their behavior. If they are still actively ambivalent, they are not going to proceed with a change. And uh, as I always say, the motivation to viewing, whether it's really within the context of the brief intervention, is a particular kind of conversation about change. So you want to make it as natural as possible. And it is more than the use of some strategies and, and uh, technical uh, interventions. So it's fundamentally big part of it is the relational piece. These are the elements of what we call the MI spirit, the collaboration, Evocation, which means you evoke, you bring from within all the way out. You ask a lot of what we call evocative questions. You're trying to really invite patients to share more. And you support autonomy. That is fundamental. You respect the autonomy. And the MI spirit basically is really that intersecting piece of these three elements. This is the uh, spirit. As I said, the spirit is more that way of being with the patient. And it's, being, it's a clinical way of being present with the patient. And obviously keeping always in mind that it's the, up to the patient to resolve the ambivalence, not to the practitioner. And uh, it's really elicited from the patient, not imposed or coerced on the patient. What are the principles of MI? And I'm going to go very briefly with that. Is, uh, uh, is the four principles and which is really expressing empathy. empathy. Empathy is fundamental, which means that how can you really fit really these principles within the spirit, within being present with the patient. So the expressing empathy is important. What we call developing discrepancy, what that means is that uh, you uh, explore with the patient where they are now, where they want it to be based on their values and beliefs. The third one is rolling with the resistance, which means that you cannot hit the resistance head on, which means when the patient starts arguing, start becoming defensive, 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's most importantly that you cannot confront that. You cannot really hit the resistance head on. You would have to roll with it. Shift gears. We discuss with the patient different things that they believe they want to focus on. So this is extremely important. And uh, the last one is, as we talked about as a part of the brief interventions too, is supporting self-efficacy. Without the confidence, patients cannot move to do it. I'm going to take just one minute here before I proceed to really what, so how do we do it in practice? How do we, how does all the stuff fit in the brief interventions or what we would want to do as a part of the interventions in the ED, which going to lead me to talk about the expert, you know, the screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. Any questions, any comments? Um, neither right oh. now, so you can continue. All Thanks right. for checking. Sure. Uh, so here, as you see from the slide, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. So as simple as it is, the five methods that form the fabric of MI is the core skills. To learn these first is extremely essential, otherwise you wouldn't be able to really learn brief interventions. These are the four important ones, the open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And obviously the big part of it is that what we need to look at is throughout the session is to elicit the change talk. Meaning what? Meaning you know what, what you're really doing here is basically getting the patients who really uh, 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 express the desire to stop using, express the need to do it, give you the reasons why they needed to do it, and and also importantly having the ability to do it. But most importantly also when you when you hear patients saying that they wanted to do that in a way that they need to do it, they have to do it, that does not necessarily translate into people doing it. So there is a difference when you hear patients saying I need to stop drinking, I need to stop using, I have to do it, these are my reasons, and I am able to do it. You need to also hear that I will do it. I will do it is a commitment language that is predictive of change, but that depends also a lot on strengthening the change talk. So you want to have more change talk in the conversation, more commitment language, then more change. Without that commitment language, you won't see that. These are some of the examples of really the closed-end versus open-ended questions. Unfortunately, when you really ask close-ended questions, the answers are going to be completely yes or no, and it truncate in a way the conversation. Like, do you want to stop drinking? Don't you think your health will improve if you stop using drugs? Did you ever try to stop drinking? All these kind of things. In fact, when you're looking at the open-ended questions, you're really having a conversation. You're inviting more communication. You know, for example, in what way do you see your drinking affecting your life? Help me understand better how you see your drinking affecting your liver. You know, how do you see the connection between your injury and your drinking? You came into the emergency room here, you were brought to the emergency room here, and you have a head injury, you were drinking, and uh, uh, you were driving. How do you see the connection here between your injury and your drinking, and how do you see what you would need to do because of that injury now as a result of your drinking? So these are more open-ended questions that would help people feel more uh, able to invite them more to share. And and these are really some of the other close-ended questions that could really potentially happening and, and, and changing them really from close-ended to open-ended. I'm going to give you this, for example, these are 10 top questions that would be perfect uh, that uh, to use, you know, in the brief intervention approach. Like, uh, for example, what are the drawbacks of using alcohol? What are the benefits of stopping using crack? And what ways do you see the connection between your drink and your ET visit? Uh, what are your concerns about meeting with your doctor? How confident are you about stopping use of cocaine? So you see how the what, how, in what way, you know, all these uh, the question, open-ended questions. And this is extremely important when it comes to, as I mentioned, the or the affirmation is here throughout the session when you're doing the brief intervention session is that you uh, need to be very, uh, a very much able to affirm the patient's efforts throughout the session. Uh, and uh, particularly, for example, that uh, you know that you're uh, uh, you're clearly a res resourceful person. You have uh, uh, tried to stop drinking before, and you are willing to do it again. So keeping in mind that when you also inject your own judgmental approach, 
which is, for example, I gave the example there of I'm so proud of you. That is not really affirming. That is really more about you. So we need to always remember when we're affirming, we are affirming what the patient has done, not what we think. The reflections, which is extremely, extremely important part of uh, the process, and the reflections is like testing hypothesis, and it always starts with you feel you are really thinking about that, you have changed this, you always really, you can reflect in different ways, you can reflect of the meaning, of the emotions, you can paraphrase, and it does really basically move the conversation, and it really encourages further exploration and shift away from a problematic statement. The summaries is another basically way of really reflecting, connecting all these, uh, uh, the data that we have in a sense, linking together and reinforcing the material. And obviously, it kind of indicates that you're following the conversation, that you're there present for the patient. And here this is the uh, change talk. When we are talking about really the change talk, and as I mentioned, is that uh, is what we're looking at here is that we want the patient to hear the patient making more of that change talk versus what we call the sustained talk, which is really the status quo. And when we talk about change talk is that when the patient starts saying that, talking about disadvantages of the status quo, advantages of changes, or being optimistic and hopeful, and expressing intention to change. When you hear these kind of statements happening, then you are really in the right direction. This is what we really do, basically. This is a part of the brief negotiated intervention that has been done in the ED, in fact, that also incorporates the importance of the confidence. And, for example, how much important it is for you, this is the scaling, the ruling, ruler, as we call the ruler, how much, is it, how much important is it for you to stop drinking? How much confident are you that you will be able to do it? And then you can give them the scale of 0 to 10, 0 not confident at all, 10 extremely confident. Where would you put yourself at this point in time? And most of the time when they say like five or six, you don't want to tell them, well, how come you're not at eight or nine? You want to ask them how come that you're really not at one or two. So you want to build on the glass half full, not the glass half empty. And then you can ask, so what do you think you would need to do to move yourself from being confident at five to being confident at seven? The pros and cons, which is also another really aspect of the brief intervention that's done in the ED, and uh, uh, asking them about the uh, how do they feel about their drinking, what do they like about the drinking, what are the benefits that they see from drinking, at the same time, what are the drawbacks that they see of the drinking. And this is what I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, folks, uh, regarding the information exchange, is there is a difference between giving information, one-way process, and moving on, and not wanting to listen to the patient's perspective, or two-way process, and encouraging the patient to be active, to think and discuss, and to do what we call, as I said, the ask, tell, ask, tell, ask, tell, and continue with the, with the conversation. So, uh, before I'm going to go back, we have half an hour to go. Now I'm going to really put it together, going back to the ED, and really talk about the, uh, the pieces of, we already talked about the screening piece of the expert, talked about the brief intervention, and we talk about the referrals to treatment, and I'll mention that very briefly. And, uh, and then really kind of look at what sort of a challenges we see there to really implement that. Any questions, uh, Chris, that we can see or comments? Uh, no, nothing new, thanks. Okay. So when it comes to the alcohol, is uh, when you really the context of really the screening and uh, uh, brief interventions, uh, what we are trying to do is to narrow the gap between patients in need of treatment and those actually receiving services. Unfortunately, uh, in the US, a very small percentage of people uh, 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 who have addictions are in treatment or seek treatment. <coughs> me. So this is really a significant problem. So we can't really, in a sense, access people to get them into treatment. And most importantly, when we talk about the ED, it's a perfect place where we can get people access to treatment. We can start while they are there with the approach and get them connected. And this is what the ESPERT is about, is a comprehensive, integrated public health approach for the delivery of the brief interventions. So we're talking about really going beyond 
and just doing the intervention, but also keeping people, getting people engaged and continue, because as we know very well, we have to look at alcohol and drug addictions as chronic relapsing medical illnesses like diabetes, asthma, hypertension, heart disease, all these things. Therefore, you know, when we're talking about really the model of care, it's a chronic model of care. It's not like a one-time shot, you know, they come and get the brief intervention in the, in the ED and then move on and they're going to be doing great for the rest of their lives. The question is going to be, I'm going to tell you also because you're going to ask me, well, how long do they last these brief interventions from what we know? like the impact of them, you know, at six months, three months, what sort of studies, and I'll talk about that in a, a short period of time. So when it comes to the model of the estimate, it's been recommended for using the EDs in patient family units, primary care settings, different settings. So now it's been moving. In fact, we are looking at a study now that we want to use the expert model also for drug use in the STD clinics, you know, and we're, we're looking at that. It's definitely supported by the NIAAA, the CDC, the Committee on Trauma of the American College of Surgeons. So, remember I talked about uh, really that earlier, is that what we're looking for is to really do it in a very short period of time, incorporating all these uh, 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 principles that I talked about, whether the MI principles or the principles of behavior change in general. Look at the tobacco, for example. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, and again, this is another area that is very much underexplored. I just want to give you an idea a little bit here. Even what we call a low-intensity aspirin, short, screening briefly, delivering a brief intervention, and referral for treatment. It can prompt, we know very well, quick attempts, quick attempts, decrease cigarette use, and quitting even if offered routinely in the ED. And you're going to ask me, why is it not done? Because again, it is not perceived as important. Or what is perceived is at the time when they present to the ED patients, they could be having a heart attack, could be having like a exacerbation of COPD and pain, and what is really addressed are these acute problems without thinking that if we want to be a little bit comprehensive and really kind of look at also the smoking, that could also be particularly significantly linked to the original, to the problem that led the patients to come into the ED. Okay, so here, uh, can you see the screen there, guys? Because I'm not sure something happened here. Um, yes, we're fine. It, okay. If you lost it somehow, just do the um, the control tab and then uh, go over to that blue flower. Okay, all right, great. Thank you for the tip, uh, Chris. So uh, this is another study that I wanted to really show you, show you is that it's 543 smokers in the, the chest pain unit found that a tailored motivation interviewing approach with follow-up telephone brief intervention sessions coupled with nicotine replacement therapy patch found positive intervention effects on cessation rates at one month. So in a sense, you know, that we know clearly that, that any sort of these interventions and if we really use them in combination with, for example, nicotine replacement treatment, that we can see uh, 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 significant benefits. So here, when we're defining the experts, we're defining obviously the screening, as we've talked about. Uh, brief intervention, brief therapy. Again, it's just uh, how we define it is again, uh, very much depends on different, uh, uh, different settings. And uh, the referral to treatment is another big piece of it. And, but the other big piece of it is the integration coordination activities. Well, you can refer somebody to treatment in the community and tell them, okay, well, I would like you to, uh, to go to that uh, outpatient clinic and and you don't set up the appointment, you don't initiate some sort of a discussion about it, what, are the, what is the likelihood chance that they're going to do it? And if you don't have a good resources and coordinating and integrating these resources with the community where they know that you can refer patients to them because we know a lot of the programs, for example, they would have to, uh, they have waiting lists, you know, that to, to get into treatment, then what's going to happen? The patient's going to be lost in the whole process. And half of that intervention, in a sense, as a part of the expert, is really, in a way, cut, and it's not really uh, uh, pursued. So this is where the problem is with the expert part, is uh, we've established the brief intervention, in a sense, the screening, and we've talked about these things, is the referral to treatment. 
little research has been done with that part. Unfortunately, it's the weak point in the expert model. The success depends on what, as I've talked to you earlier, and this is one of the reasons we were talking about why EDs do not screen, do not do brief intervention, do not do referrals of treatment, do not do the whole expert. Well, first of all, if you don't have available resources in your local community to refer these patients to, you know, what would be the point in a way? That's the attitude, which in a sense I can understand. And also the relationship between the ED team and the treatment sites. So if you really are going to refer a patient to my clinic and I do not have any sort of really relationship with you and I don't even know you're going to be referring patients to me and you've never talked with me, well, why would I need to take your patients? I have other patients that I need to take from other resources. And that can create a big problem. And the big issue with going back to what we talked about is the patient's motivation to change and to follow through a treatment. So the success of that referral to treatment is going to depend on the patient's ability and desire to follow through with the referral. Telling the patient, I would like you to go to that clinic, does not make the patient go to the clinic. The patients have to eventually decide why it's important for them to do it. What you can do, you can have a conversation about the importance of doing it. You can give the advice to do it, but it's up to the patient to follow through and do it. The booster sessions have been very uh, uh, interesting when it comes to the uh, uh, expert. Is the research that suggests that even minimal follow-up referrals can increase the effectiveness of the brief intervention, like a phone call. You can call the patients after, uh, you know, let's say uh, uh, three weeks after the intervention and call and check. I would like to see how you've been doing since we had our session the last time. Uh, we talked about you reducing your drinking, and I want to get some sense from you on how you've been doing with your drinking. And this obviously is really as, as, as really short and as could be the intervention, five minutes, seven minutes over the phone, or in any way done, you know, it can be really very much effective. So let me kind of here uh, finish up with that section on the outcome research, because I keep talking about uh, uh, why it's important to do it, it does work, and everything, and, but I'm not really, I haven't shared with you yet what we know and how much we know about about in terms of the studies, in terms of the scientific uh, uh, and the research piece. And I thought I'll leave it till the end because uh, it can be sometimes a little bit uh, tedious here, you know, to go through a lot of the studies. I try to simplify it as much as I can and make it much more practical for you. Uh, any questions, any thoughts before I proceed with the last section here? Uh, yes, there is one. Um, most emergency department doctors are going to say they are not there to counsel the patient. How does an ED doctor have the time to ask all these questions, even if it's considered brief? Yeah, well, this is a good question. I think the issue is not just the ED physicians, it's the whole ED staff. It could be a nurse, could be anybody, you know, and the, the whole idea of that it takes too much time is really, uh, uh, is really obviously a big challenge, and we realize they want to move people quickly, you know, and the question is not if, if you really have the five, seven minutes, ten minutes, the way you're doing it when you're talking with the patient, let's say they have five, seven minutes, let's say, and you're keeping in mind, this patient is usually seen by two, three, four people, usually seen by a nurse, by a physician, by a trainee sometimes in, 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 in sort of setting, by the social worker. So there are so many people in a way involved that it doesn't require just the physician to do that. This could be done by the social worker, that intervention. It could be done by the nurse. If they are interacting with the patient for five, seven, eight, ten minutes, you can utilize that as an opportunity to do that brief intervention. I think, unfortunately, it's feeling intimidated by the fact that I need to do too much and I don't have the time to do it. In fact, if, if we think about it from an operational point of view, the patient sees so many people, so many staff members, that some staff members could be assigned to really do that if they believe it's important to do it. So again, it goes back to the buy-in from the, uh, uh, you know, the the institution and the, the leadership, and uh, and and uh, so this is where the problem is. I mean, it's just uh, and 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 again, as I mentioned, if if the staff who do not see the importance of doing it, do not see it, that it works. You know, that they are not going to, regardless of what you're going to do, they're going to always find these different reasons why, you know, they cannot really do it. Other questions? Uh, no, that's it. Thanks. Okay.
Okay, well, let's finish up here with the, uh, you know, I want to really spend like 10 minutes here, finish up with that and give you another five minutes for comments. And uh, so 22 studies published uh, and you have 15 studies reported the uh, alcohol use disorder outcomes, six studies, both alcohol use and drug use. One study only reported the uh, drug use outcomes. So what did they look at with the outcomes? I mean, if you want to look, uh, as you want to see whether people don't drink as much, the frequency, you know, reduction in the consequences, negative consequences, also reduction in what we call the assessment scores, which what we talked about, the screening scores, which means that they have had a, 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 a severe drug problem based on the scores, and now they don't have it as much. That's really a good sign. And also increased rates of entry into treatment. That is a huge, because we're referring these people to treatment. And the people we're referring to treatment are the people who are mostly at the high risk and the people who are really more of the uh, uh, dependent. So here, in terms of the alcohol use, the expert force is what we call the treatment as usual. And uh, if we look at the overall, there are ca four categories. And I don't want to really overwhelm you here with the information, but the bottom line is that it does reduce the drinking and follow-up, you know, which is really very important. It, it gives, it showed greater reduction in the consequences. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there was no difference in when it comes to the follow-up quantity and frequency. Uh, and uh, great reduction in the assessment scores. You remember the, the four thing I said? And there is a basically a no significant difference when it comes to the uh, expert and the, the treatment as usual on any outcome criteria. And they both looked at, in a sense, six months and 12 months follow. Because you remember what I mentioned earlier, we want to also make sure that whatever intervention we're doing, it's going to have a long-term effect. And, uh, and in fact, neither of these studies included the booster sessions, which really makes you really wonder about it. So, so in a sense, that uh, this is not really bad. It, it makes a difference. I mean, uh, we will want it to be much better than that. You know, in a sense, yes. But obviously, with what we got in terms of really the reductions in the consequences, you know, and great reduction in the follow-up quantity and frequency, this is already significant. So the question is that what sort of a brief intervention versus brief intervention doesn't make a difference how you do it or what sort of an intervention. And in fact, uh, that one thing to keep in mind is when you give information, an intervention, a brief intervention with just information giving, you remember I talked about it earlier, are minimally effective. When you give information and advice with counseling, which is what I've talked about with really uh, doing the pros and cons, uh, negotiating, then negotiating, uh, looking at the importance of confidence, and exploring that, exploring their ambivalence, then you're going to see really much better response. And obviously, when you do it from a more than MI-based intervention, it is definitely superior to the information or the feedback-based interventions. Substance use disorder, seven studies. And uh, not really very good, but uh, not very bad in a sense. You know, that six out of the studies that found statistically significant improvements, which is really great, you know, in a sense. Improvements of what? The quantity and frequency. And based, uh, obviously, in favor of the expert. And uh, in fact, two of the two studies that reported SUD uh, 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 related level of treatment engagements found significant results in favor of experts, so which means that the expert has helped more than the treatment as usual to get people to get them into treatment. So the expert was effective in getting people into treatment. So you can ask me the population that have been used. Well, if we look at, uh, interestingly enough, it's all across diversity, ethnic diversity and age diversity. And, uh, and very important to really think about it as uh, that uh, all across diverse populations, you know, uh, it's really consistently an effective intervention, the aspect itself. And uh, also four out of the five studies that found it to be uh, 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 an effective intervention with adolescent patients at risk for alcohol use and substance use. So which is really also uh, makes it more important that to really also uh, use it with adolescents too. Let me give you here from the 22 publications. I don't know if you can see the slide very well here. Good news, bad news when it comes to implementation. And this is what we've been discussing, guys. You've been uh, asking some of the questions about the reasons why people don't want to do it, you know, and all these things. First of all, the good news, they are much more than the bad news. 
the people who received patient who received aspirin were more likely to enter treatment. Perfect. The ED staff accepted, reported the aspirin as an acceptable model for treating alcohol use disorder, SUD related issues. This is from the studies, from the research studies. So it is really accepted in a sense. It was found to increase the capture rate by over 50%. So which means that if we're screening these people, we are really capturing them. And you, if you're doing the aspirin, we're capturing more of these people who have the addictions, which is which, what we desperately need because we want to identify these people so we can do the intervention and get them into treatment. It can be done by a variety of middle and upper level ED clinicians, so it does not have to be the physicians all the time. It can be effectively delivered through a variety of modalities. The bad news is that, look at the screening, what happens to the screening for alcohol and drug use, uh, uh, the ED staff, it fell by 25% when the research staff was not present. So if there was no research study there, the screening really decreased by 25%. So you see how people lose that sort of an interest. And uh, the rates of the successful aspirin implementation, the implementation piece can be as low as 40% across ED sites, which is really a big struggle, and we need to figure out to do something about it. And this is where also the challenge that I've talked about earlier, the system level barriers, long-term funding, support for training, and ongoing supervision. So if you have a buy-in, but you don't have the resources that the administration will give you to train your staff to do it. Well, where are you going to get the money to do it? Where are you going to get the, the people to really train the staff and to supervise the staff? Here we go. We are really more into really the problem of the fiscal issues. And the department level barriers is that the need for buy-in is not always something that is really guaranteed. And obviously, here we go. We've talked about it, how to integrate expert within already busy EDs. You know, and, uh, and unfortunately, if you look at the EDs those days, they've been really extremely swamped with more and more and more patients, again, particularly with a lot of the patients who are uninsured or underinsured. And again, uh, here, I don't want to get into it too much, but uh, just to give you an idea a little bit about the costs and the benefits, and there are codes that can be used to build. And keep in mind, as when we're really thinking a lot about really the uh, cost saving, it's huge. The cost of the escort implementation, you have it there, range between $15 and $205 per patient. But if you look at the benefits of the implementation, it ranged between $95 and $366 per patient. We are basically saving, you know, from doing it. You know, the, and look at the projected annual savings, if we do it as a nation, nationwide, program, they'll estimate to be $1.82 billion. So in a sense, it's worth to spend the money on training and then get as much of that really be savings. And again, if we look at the Medicare and Medicaid programs, they are a possible funding source for the expert and, and really uh, trying to really work with the, with, the, with, the, with the insurers also. And now, like for example, CCBHO and everything, they are really more and more able to provide, uh, there are codes to really uh, 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 bill for the uh, brief intervention, but as I said, you know, there are so many complicating factors that you don't basically, uh, it's not as simple and easy to implement. Finishing up here is, uh, I want to tell you the study that I mentioned to you earlier about what we're doing, multi-site study, is uh, uh, basically there are what we call three arms. We're looking at minimal screening, screening plus assessment and referral, brief interventions with two telephone boosters. So. What uh, we are now basically in the phase of uh, follow-up, uh, you know, and we're uh, hopefully going to see whether expert works in uh, uh, EDs for drug use, and we're going to see the difference whether screening alone, screening plus assessment and referral and brief intervention, uh, these three arms, whether each one of them presents separate results. Obviously, you know, the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, a challenge that we have is how to really develop and implement and support standardized model for training, implementing within very busy ED settings. And also, uh, what would be the best practices that we can come up with? How can we be creative uh, when it comes to connecting patients with community resources and treatment options? And we know also a lot of these outpatient treatment, uh, uh, rehabs, uh, 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 detox places, they are really swamped. You know, also, they have uh, also their own struggles. 
And also remember to really continue to explore the cost saving potential of the expert models and DED settings. These are some of these references and uh, that you could really, and also if you're interested in learning more and more about that, that is also a whole section on the brief interventions is in the motivation interviewing website, which is www.motivationinterview.org. Uh, I am done, and I can take uh, questions, comments. Uh. OK. Uh, well, first of all, I will um, take the screen back. So you can OK. Just... You're in charge, Chris. <laughs> there we go. Um, OK. Uh, I, there was one person who had a comment, and it really was shown on your a second to the last slide, I think. They say, unless the hospital culture changes and accepts, addic accepts addiction as a treatable illness, and they receive training and support, these changes will take a little longer to occur. Excellent point. Absolutely. Okay, and um, I think that does it for this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. This was very, very uh, informative, and we appreciate thank, thank, your time. Thank you, everybody. And uh, and I have my website is there, and you can go also through Chris if you need any particular references, any specific things I mentioned uh, that you would want more references on, more uh, papers. You please let me know, and you can tell Chris. You know, I, I would be glad to uh, read the. Uh, uh, you know, provide them for you. Um, yes, uh, I already have an email ready to send to all attendees that will have your PowerPoints in it, so they will have that. And then within the next few days, within the next week, I'll send out another um, email to all the attendees that will have either links or copies of the various screens and other documents you mentioned. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very, Thanks. very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Chris. Bye-bye.